The vineyard name is Tuscawalami Vineyard. Does it have a meaning, the name? Uh, it does. What does it mean, Annie? We found this name in a book of names from indigenous tribes of the area, and we really want to honor all the people who've touched this land. Um, it is a phrase that was borrowed from a creek in the Wallawa area that is Owl Creek, or where the owls dwell. And being that our name is Raptor Ridge, uh, raptors are birds of prey, owls, hawks, kestrels, so we thought it would be appropriate to not only honor the birds, but also honor the first peoples here with the name Tuscawalami. Inside the fence, we have about 20 acres of grapes on a 27-acre property. The seven acres at the bottom is our um, riparian zone. So we, we're part of um, a sustainability program here, quite prevalent in Oregon, well, in the Pacific Northwest, called LIVE. Um, it's an independent third-party assessment of what it means to be sustainable in a measurable way. One of the measures is a certain percentage of your property needs to be left um, uh, untouched and, and kind of an eco reserve and so that's what the seven acres at the bottom is all about. We produce nominally 10,000 cases a year. Now not just from this property, so I farm uh, Tuscawalami Vineyard and Harbinger Vineyard here in the Shahila Mountains and then we have long-term uh, you could say contracts, I say friendships, with growers all around the Willamette Valley about 12 other growers that uh, we've sourced fruit from for 25 vintages now. Um, so from really, the, yeah, within this, this one brand, you can reach into four of the now seven nested AVAs in the Willamette Valley. So it's a nice survey of the Willamette Valley. I've done everything from starting our first wine club when we were brand new um, to getting on the road pretty frequently and traveling and selling our wine across the nation into 32 states. Um, I'm also kind of the, com the communications person, so I do a lot of the writing and that kind of thing. The voice of Raptor Ridge. Yes. <laughs> and Scott. Well, um, yes, I try to overlap with Annie as often as possible, <laughs> <laughs> being married and all. Uh, um, I'm in charge of production, so uh, growing the grapes, getting them uh, through the barrels and into the bottle with whatever label Annie once put on it. <laughs> um, that's really my main focus. Um, since retiring from a day job about five years ago, I've joined Annie in that um, distribution channel as well. So we both um, are that rare breed of owners, winemakers, that go out and meet the restaurant tour, the wine shop owner, and talk directly to them about the craft and the art and the product that we're putting in the bottle. So I've been joining Annie, overlapping in uh, the distribution mm -hmm. channel, as well as the, the wine growing, as I like to call it. I like to, to work with language a little bit around those things. I mean, my favorite example is people who think they only like sweet wine. Um, the definition of the word sweet is very different to different people and a lot of times I find when I put wines in front of them then and try to discern what they're meaning by sweet, it's fruity that they like. And so I can often turn somebody on to a more balanced wine that has both fruit and acidity in it if I point out to them, well I think what you're saying is you like fruit and here's why and let's try these two wines. So I like to do that. Um, if people don't like reds, we have a lot of whites, too. So we have, we have a lot of things going on in the tasting room other than just Oregon Pinot Noir. And we do definitely have that, of course. But we have interesting eclectic varietals that people can try um, in the white wine spectrum. And then we also have Southern Oregon um, Tempranillo. So we have a little bit for everyone. And then the other thing I love to do is make sure that if there's someone in a group of people who feels like they don't know enough about wine, I love to tease them out a little bit and get them a little more confident because I love making wine more approachable myself. That's one of my main aims. I'm not a, an expert in wine. I knew nothing about wine before I met Scott. And so I'm a great example of somebody who has learned along the way. 
and I want to make that friendly and comfortable for people. Um, off camera behind you is our Aroma Apothecary, which is a really great place to play around. It is a approachable version of the Nez de Vin kit from France, which is the 54 most common aromatics in wine. And we've put it into little glass vials with cotton balls so people can play around. It's like a little exploratorium of scent over there. So people can test themselves. They're all numbered, so they can either test themselves or test the know-it-all in the group. And what I love to see <laughs> is somebody who thinks they know nothing about wine, who has a really awesome palate, They're just and they it. end yeah. up nailing the, the scents. And then the person who is the aficionado might not have as good a palate as they do. Sure. So it's kind of fun to see that flip a little bit as people are able to play more with scents and see that it's, it's beyond just the wine. Oftentimes we get asked about uh, the dinosaur reference here, and if I'm in a playful mood, I'll, I'll tell the fictitious story that uh, when we bought the property, we were doing soil tests to make sure we had the right um, low soil on top of jewelry, and we discovered these fossilized bones, and we brought some people out from uh, Oregon University, and they said, my goodness, that's, uh, that, those are raptors, those are raptor bones. And people look at us and say, really? And I, no, just kidding. I told that he story. Was just, that was not a real story. <laughs> well, we have to overemphasize that because um, <laughs> the neighbors across the valley there, the Ponzi's, had their uh, tasting room staff here, and I was telling that joke again. And uh, since that time, we've had more than one visitor to the valley come over here and say, oh, the Ponzi sent us over. They said you have raptor bones. <laughs> We noticed since we moved to the valley that this place is thick with those birds of prey day and night um, that Annie was talking about. Uh, in fact, if we're lucky, we may have one soar by here while we're visiting with you this what morning. Are you, what kind of birds are you talking about? Red-tailed hawks. Uh, we have peregrine falcons. We have osprey. We have eagles. Um, really? Lots of uh, uh, turkey vultures. Um, if we were here in the evening, we'd see great horned owls. I hear barn owls down in the, um, down in the forest. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all manner of raptors. Yeah. And we, we work with raptor rescue foundations as oh, well. Right. So we've done a couple of raptor releases on the property and our site has been designated as an ideal place to release raptors. So we've actually released some raptors that had been brought back from injury and were able to be um, reacclimated to the wild. Uh, but next door to us here, my neighbors hobby is digging ponds and I mean like 10 acre ponds that's what he does on the weekend with his excavator so he's put in a couple of ponds and stocked them with trout and oh. ever since that happened we've seen the eagle and the uh, the osprey and the peregrine coming out they fly by and ask us about what wine goes with trout and so, you know, <laughs> food and wine pairing for the eagles <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, we cross paths in the tech world. So when I first met Scott, we were both working for a small company called Sequent Computer Systems. And we were both um, engaged in some educational activities. He was one of my educational subject matter experts on a particular technology. And I a was... A SME. A SME. You were one of my SMEs. Um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, so we quickly learned that we were good working together on educational materials, which comes in handy these days too. Um, and then I very swiftly learned about the fact that he had just started a winery and I was intrigued by that. And I was actually at that time working in California and looking at moving up here to headquarters. So we basically got to know each other through work. Um, I then was drafted to come help with harvest and bottling and as everybody in Scott's circle of friends was and did and um, that just led to other things. So that's how I ended up getting involved. Um, I got involved with this guy. Um, always have been interested in a small family business. Um, my background, my family background is one of coming from a family of educators. So. That was the family business, if you will. Um, and that also comes around full circle to being a very handy kind of um, set of, of experiences to have when you're talking about wine and educating people about your story and 
um, finding different ways to talk to different people who learn in different ways. So that's come in handy. Um, and you, Scott? That's about it. And me. Uh, my background was in uh, science and engineering. I was recruited out here to the Silicon Forest a long time ago to work for a burgeoning company that was just moving out of California called Intel. Uh, and I've never heard of them. Uh, they've, <laughs> they've struggled along um, and sort of under the radar, as it were, for uh, about 50 years now. Um, but between Intel and uh, Sequent and some other companies, I spent 40 years, believe it or not, working in high tech um, and was captivated by the natural world here surrounding Portland, Oregon. Um, when I bought um, what is now our current home site, um, the neighbors were planting these crazy row crops uh, that I found quite interesting. My family back in the Midwest comes from um, homesteader stock. Uh, grandparents homesteaded in Kansas. I was shipped off to the farm. So I had a little bit of farming background and interest in growing things. Uh, so these row crops that I had never seen before, I came to learn our wine grapes. And uh, sort of a uh, story not unlike uh, Mark Twain's uh, Huck Finn, you know, I'll show you how to whitewash a fence. Uh, so Betty Wall of Wall Vineyard fame taught me how to uh, prune grapes and how to harvest grapes and <laughs> basically do all the work that she didn't want to do. <laughs> and in exchange, not for money, but for free grapes, um, I was given access to um, this very interesting world of wine growing and started making wine as a home winemaker with friends and sharing it with friends. And this is basically a hobby that got way out of control. Mm -hmm.